I am Jeroen van Mij, and I welcome you to my lecture series on computer and network security. In this first video on asymmetric encryption, I will introduce the basics of this approach, which is an alternative to symmetric encryption. Before we delve into the details, let's take a look at some basic facts about asymmetric encryption. It is also known as public key cryptography, mainly because it uses a public and a private key, in contrast to symmetric encryption, which only uses a private or secret key. Also, it's based on radically different concepts than symmetric encryption. Instead of using substitution and permutation, it uses mathematical functions. It also addresses two important concerns with symmetric encryption. First of all, in symmetric encryption, we need some trusted key distribution center to distribute our secret keys. Second, symmetric encryption does not allow digital signatures, as I explained in previous videos. As such, asymmetric encryption, due to its use of a public key, will enable various new applications in key distribution and digital signatures or authentication. The idea of asymmetric encryption is relatively young. While symmetric encryption has been around for thousands of years, asymmetric encryption was first made public by Diffie and Hellman in 1976. Before this time, only symmetric encryption was in use. There are a lot of misconceptions about the security of asymmetric encryption. So let's play fact and fiction for a moment to take a closer look at this. First statement I would like to make is that public key encryption is more secure than private encryption. Is this true or not? Actually, it is false. Public key encryption is not inherently more secure than private or symmetric encryption. The security similarly depends on the size of the key and the computational complexity of breaking the cipher. Second statement, public key encryption has made symmetric encryption obsolete because it enables the same applications, but on top of that, it also enables key distribution and digital signatures. Again, this statement is false. While indeed the applications of public key encryption are broader, it has some issues. Mainly, its computational overhead is much bigger than of symmetric encryption algorithms. This is the case for all asymmetric encryption algorithms that have been proposed to date. As such, it's mainly useful for encrypting small messages, and its applications are therefore uh, digital signatures and key management. It is too computationally intensive for general purpose confidentiality, for example. The last statement is that key distribution is trivial in public key encryption. Again, this is false. While for symmetric encryption a central agent is needed, also for distribution of public keys there is a need for either some central key distribution agent or for the use of certificates to ensure that there are no man-in-the-middle attacks when distributing public keys. And the process is not necessarily more straightforward. Because of its use of both a public and a private key, asymmetric encryption is more versatile than symmetric encryption. Just like symmetric encryption, it can be used to provide confidentiality, but it can also provide authentication. But let's start with taking a look at how to provide confidentiality of messages using asymmetric encryption. The process is somewhat similar to symmetric encryption, but of course, due to the use of two different keys, there are some small differences. There's a public and a private key, which together make up the key pair. For confidentiality, the public key is used by the encryption algorithm. So the source or sender A will use the public key in the encryption algorithm to encrypt the message X. This results in a ciphertext Y, which is sent over the network. The decryption algorithm at the destination or receiver B uses the private key to decrypt a message. 
This means that anyone could encrypt messages that gets access to the public key, which in essence is publicly available, but only the intended recipient of the message that has access to the private key, which is not shared with anyone else, can actually decrypt the message. That means that the destination should generate the key pair and then share the public key with the sender. Crypto analysts, just like with symmetric encryption, will try to intercept ciphertext and public keys, which are available, for example, to an eavesdropper, to obtain the private key and the plain text message X, or at least to estimate them. As I mentioned, public key cryptography can also be used to provide authentication. The goal here is no longer to keep a message secret while it's being transmitted, but to ensure that the message is not altered during transmission. Again, we make use of a public and a private key. Now, however, the use is inverted. The private key is used in the encryption step, while the public key is used in the decryption step. As only the source A has access to the private key, only A can successfully encrypt a message. That means that anyone who gains access to the public key, which is inherently public, will be able to decrypt it and verify that this message was indeed created by A, as no one besides A has the ability to encrypt the message successfully. In this case, the crypto analyst will not try to obtain the original message X, as it can be retrieved by anyone anyway, but will try to obtain the private key PRA. If an attacker obtains this private key, they will be able to encrypt messages pretending they originate from the source A. Obviously, for this to work successfully, we need to ensure that this public key indeed is the original public key of source A. This is related to the key distribution problem, and we will talk about this in later lectures. And as you can see in this figure, authentication and confidentiality can also be combined into a single system. Here, two key pairs are used a key pair generated by the source for authentication and one generated by the destination for secrecy or confidentiality. Besides that, the principle is exactly the same. We use A's private key to encrypt a message for authentication and B's public key to encrypt it for secrecy. B then uses the other two keys to perform the inverse decryption. And asymmetric ciphers have three important applications. I already showed you how to perform encryption and digital signatures or authentication with these ciphers. Another important application is key exchange, where asymmetric ciphers are used to securely exchange uh, secret keys for symmetric encryption. There are several different asymmetric ciphers that have been proposed throughout the years. And um, some of these are very flexible, like RSA and elliptic curves, which can be used to provide all three applications, while others focus on a single application. For example, Diffie-Hellman is used for key exchange and Algamal encryption for digital signatures. In this video lecture, I will talk mainly about RSA. In future lect uh, video lectures on key exchange, I will also talk about other approaches like Diffie-Hellman. Before I finish this video, let's take a look at the requirements of public key cryptography algorithms. I'll describe these requirements from the point of view of encryption. When used for authentication, the use of the public and private key is basically inverted. So let's take a look at the important requirements. The first one is that it should be computationally easy to generate a key pair consisting of a public and a private key. Second requirement is that it should also be computationally easy, given a public key and a message M, to generate the corresponding ciphertext. Third, it should be computationally easy, given the private key and the ciphertext to recover the plain text. 
so to uh, enable decryption. Fourth, it should be computationally infeasible knowing one of the keys to generate the other. This is to prevent that, for example, a public key is um, publicly shared and that an attacker using this publicly shared public key is able to retrieve the private key, which would allow them to decrypt the message. It should also be infeasible knowing the public key and the ciphertext to recover the original message, obviously for purposes of secrecy when used for confidentiality. And then finally, there's a sixth optional requirement, is that the two keys can be applied in either order. If this is the case, then each key can be used either for encryption or decryption, and that makes the algorithm more flexible, supporting multiple applications. This is the end of my video on the introduction of asymmetric encryption. In the next video, I will introduce the RSA algorithm, which is a widely used asymmetric encryption algorithm.